Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. It's been another intense period on the energy front, with load shedding, new procurements, a climate finance announcement, and the creation of a new energy council. Terence Creamer joins me to discuss developments. Hi, Terence. Hi, Chanel. The performance of the coal fleet still remains a worry. Yes, it's a big worry for South Africa. You know, we entered into this reliability maintenance program over a year ago, and there was a view that by around this time, October, November, uh, we would be seeing a stabilization of the coal fleet, but that hasn't materialized. And we see that the coal fleet performed very badly in the last few weeks. At times, you know, we've seen over 16,000 megawatts off the system from the coal fleet. It's become very volatile, remains very volatile and unreliable. And uh, Eskim is saying they just haven't had enough time to do the, the fundamental repairs that are needed. They just don't have enough space in the system to do that because there's a, a shortage of electricity in the system because we haven't procured for so many years. Since 2015, we haven't procured any new megawatts. So there's this lack of time and space. There's this big backlog of maintenance. So the coal fleet's going to take longer to stabilise. And even if it's when it does, it will stabilise at a lower level, I think, because some of these units are at, at so old and in such a bad state of repair uh, they, they, they won't really give us the so-called theoretical 40 uh, gigs of uh, capacity that's in the system. We're never anywhere near that, and I don't think we're ever going to recover to that. At the moment, the electricity energy availability factor from the coal fleet has dipped below 65%. That's, a, that's really dismal. Back in the day, they used to have that 90% uh, percent EAF sort of aspiration and met it for a number of years. We know we're near that now, as we can see, at around below 65%. The current target is 70%. We're nowhere near the current target. If we were, we wouldn't be seeing the lights go off. And we're also below last year's performance. So on all levels, things are quite worrying. And again, we have to realise this coal fleet is mostly old and is not going to get necessarily any better. I think that they can get some of the units operating uh, at a more stable level but the, the, this fleet uh, needs to be replaced. Some system relief may come from newly procured projects, but it's not enough. It's definitely not enough. So we've had the first bid window um, post the, uh, the Eskom induced delay uh, or disruption. Back in 2015, Eskom said they're no longer willing to buy any more capacity from independent power producers, particularly renewable energy power producers. And uh, so we had this hiatus uh, where the Renewable Energy pro Procurement Program, which was lauded internationally and which was quite successful, in both in bringing in uh, much needed capacity and uh, private sector investment into the electricity industry, initially at a very high cost. But over the every successive round, we've seen a, a decline in the costs and we uh, the latest almost 2,600 megawatts procured of wind and soda have come in at an average weighted cost at uh, b below uh, well around 48 cents a kilowatt hour. So if we know what we are uh, buying as consumers, we're buying at a much higher rate from our municipalities than that. Obviously, this is electricity that's variable. It needs to be supported by the grid. It needs to be supported by uh, other generation uh, units when the sun doesn't shine and when the wind doesn't blow. But this does show you that uh, what people have been saying for many years is that uh, renewables are the least cost new electricity available. They're now coming in at about the price of the, the cost of coal. So that's just the fuel source into these power stations, Never, uh, uh, let alone this is an, the actual product. This is the actual electricity, not just the primary energy. So this is these are very good prices. And uh, these are good prices in a fairly uncertain environment. One, we've had a very long uh, period of hiatus. We've put in new rules around the bidding criteria, new uh, pr uh, procurement rules around how we go about localization, uh, community development. Uh, so there's been a sort of a wobbly, but we saw over 102 bidders. In the end, we procured 25 of those. They have six months to close those projects. And unfortunately, these will take 36 months to build. And obviously, because there's been an erosion of capacity from this long period of, of no action, uh, you know, everyone's going to be scrambling for the same resources, the construction resources. We know the construction industry has been decimated. 
Uh, they're going to be looking for the same transport and logistics resources, the same lifting resources for the cranes. So this is uh, uh, going to be something that we now have to re almost re-establish in South Africa after this long period. Fortunately, we have had just come out of the bid window for projects being built. So some of that capacity has been re-established. But there's still some uncertainties around whether some of these projects will be able to close. We saw what happened with the so-called emergency procurement round, the risk mitigation round, landed up in court. There's uh, very big concerns about the local content around uh, PV panels for that program. Those aren't going to go away for bid window fire projects. So that's going to be a risk to closing the next six months. But I think there is a realization around this and they want to get these projects going. It looks like these projects will probably come in long before the so-called emergency projects, even though that still is going ahead. Um, so so th that is positive progress, but in a context where we at least 6,000 megawatts short, or between 4,000 and 6,000 megawatts short, this is not enough. Uh, we need to get into a steady rhythm of procurement. And then on top of it, we haven't spent enough on our grid strengthening, our grid expansion, which means that the best acreage uh, for solar and wind projects is not going to be available for the next round, which is in January. So bidders are going to go have to go elsewhere with the supply chain pressures in the system, uh, with uh, the rising prices of a lot of components around the world, uh, and with these grid constraints, which means you have to go to areas that are not the best solar and wind resources. You may find that these prices, well, it will be interesting to see whether we can repeat and better these prices. The minister seems fairly confident that we can. But I suppose we'll have to wait and see what happens in January. Likewise, there has been some positive yet insufficient progress on the financing front. Yes, I mean, South Africa became the poster child of the just energy transition internationally this week uh, with the US, the UK, France, Germany, the European Union backing a, uh, a climate financing deal uh, of about 131 billion rand, which is a, a lot of money. Uh, there's obviously the devil again is in the details, how that money is going to flow, how much of it is will be grant related, how much of it will be loan, at what concessional rates those will be. We don't have any visibility of that. It's a high level political declaration of support. And uh, it, you know, it's, uh, it basically comes down to a lot of backroom work that Eskom initiated over the last year really intensively as they saw that they had to decommission these coal-fired power stations. Communities were going to be left vulnerable. They have a ready-made project pipeline that they feel that uh, can help both in giving communities some livelihoods as well as uh, improving the foundations of this very fragile electricity system at the moment. So a lot of the money would be directed towards the grid, I think. There'll be some renewable investments around the coal plants, maybe, maybe some gas. It'll be interesting whether these uh, um, counterparties will be willing to invest in gas to power. But definitely the renewables aspects at the repowering of, say, for instance, Kamati, which closes officially next year, I think there will be money available for that. So we'll see how this lands. Obviously, this is a politically sensitive thing. It does tie us to a certain block of countries. Uh, it has ties us to a block of countries that has not always honored their commitments in the past. But I think in the context of the huge need, so we need to invest 140, 170 billion in our grid over the next 10 years. We need to invest multiples of that in generation. Having this uh, concessional finance available at the sort of cheaper rate for the country is very important. And it's now about really negotiating the best deal and we have to enter those in good faith and we have to enter these with the objective of getting every penny rather than uh, letting those uh, letting it die on the vine because of our own internal angst. And of course, it doesn't preclude us from approaching other uh, counterparties in future. I think the Chinese would be willing to look at our market and uh, willing to also create just transition uh, type uh, investments in South Africa. So I think uh, we, sh we should use this just as the start, as Eskim has said. It's just the first, uh, the initial stages of getting as much as we can in this context where the world is more willing to offer finance for decarbonisation. We are a good place to do decarbonisation, being the 12th largest emitter in the world. 
having a coal fleet that is old and needs to be decommissioned, in fact, is decommissioning itself, and that's why we have load shedding. We need to make these investments, and we need to make the most of this climate finance transaction. Lastly, there is a move to set up an industry body to engage more coherently with governments. Yes, the Minister Mantash has been very clear that he doesn't like this very bitty approach. He feels it's almost lobbying based. It's, it's, uh, he feels that people approach the energy matters, the debate, on a, as competitors rather as, than as colleagues. So he's been long wanting something akin to a minerals council in the energy sector where he feels he has a single place, a platform to engage, where he feels the, the sort of shrill nature of the debate might be tempered by having uh, multiple voices. So this has been launched. It's going to be led by Fleetwood Krobler of Sassel. It's very incumbent heavy. So it's really, it's the Sassels, it's the Eskims, it's the Central Energy Funds, it's the mining industry. And I think that is a bit of a worry. I mean, I think when you're launching something new like this and we're in such a major transition, I think the other bodies had to be there. So, th so the petroleum voice is there very much. The mining voice is there very much. The incumbent voices of electricity are there very much. No sign of the renewable energy associations and IPPs in this council at this stage. No sign even of the nuclear uh, body at this stage. So I think that it was a bit of a missed opportunity. I think, yes, it would be good to have a good platform, uh, but I think that's put the hackles up immediately, which is not what you're wanting to do. But um, Fleetwood Krubler made it clear that this was just to try and get things moving and not to let this issue linger. There's been a long call from government to have this single uh, counterparty voice. Um, so th they've, they've moved and they're now going to be reaching out to more and more uh, uh, components of this very fast-changing energy industry. It does, for instance, include important uh, consumer, body, uh, consumer aspects, which I think is good, the, the mining industry being very energy intensive, and then the automotive sector also being an important component, because they don't only want uh, to, m to be able to manufacture hybrid or um, a battery electric or fuel cell vehicles in South Africa, because they're so export intensive, 60% of our vehicles that we manufacture go out uh, on ships to the rest of the world, many to these developed markets that are thinking about carbon border adjustments. They need that electricity not only to be available and stable, but they need it to be renewable. So it's important for their voice to be there because otherwise they're going to start getting locked out of these markets because of the carbon heavy nature of the electricity used to manufacture these vehicles. So. It is important, I think, some of that architecture is important to have those consumer voices in there. Uh, but I think the, the, the lack of the renewables voice and even the nuclear voice at the start uh, is a missed opportunity. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our engineering news daily email newsletter.